Um, so, uh, might be a little bit of a light day today, but there's not a whole lot to talk about. Um, my main goal is to go over the regularization stuff. Um, I mean, a good portion of the assignment three, uh, you do have to kind of understand the regularization. So I was going to go over that notebook. Um, but uh, yeah, a couple of, of more hints. Uh, I thought I would talk about the assignment three specifically. Uh, I might book in this. I might uh, do it uh, here and then might do it at the end uh, to hit some other people that maybe come in a bit later. Um, so, um, first of all, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and start talking about this. Somebody came and asked me at the end of class the other day. Um, and so it does look like uh, something, I wasn't really expecting it. Uh, so for the task three, you're supposed to use the, the train test split. Um, and like the announcement said here, um, I wasn't expecting you to set the random seed in here, and apparently that causes it to, to uh, not work, uh, not to pass the tests. Uh, in fact, actually, I mean, I like, I, if I had time, I would go back and actually do it the way I saw the people were doing it. So um, let me just show you kind of explicitly here. So, and then I'll maybe do this again at the end of class. But, um, um, so let's say for this one, for the third one, let's say I've got some data um, of the right shape. Uh, we'll just randomly generate some. So we've got our X and our Y. Um, so hopefully I'm doing this right. So if you do the uh, the the test train split like I was showing here, um, so I'm, my tests were built expecting that you just set the random seed before you actually call. Uh, your um, the before the the, uh, the the test learning curve errors or before the learning curve errors function is called, so 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 um, uh, so basically, I was expecting that you had done something like this um, before you called it, and um, for some reason I'm not too certain why, but you actually get a, a split of 7981 um, if you do it. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, but uh, here, if I did it right, yeah, so, so we did get a split of like 80 common law, but I was kind of expecting you to do it like that. So uh, if I thought about it, I, I do like, you can actually set your state, your, your seed, the random state will actually set the seed here. So some, some people were doing that. Um, let me... Uh, um, before I do that, so for example, if I do it where I set the seed before we call the the function or before we call the test train split, we get these values. Um, I should have done this in a different uh, cell here. So we get uh, we go ahead and generate my values for my x and y, um, and then uh, let's show what we get here in let's say the first five of my train. Right, so uh, you actually would get the same result. So if I did it um, like this, I think you'd find that you would get the same result. Uh, so if instead of setting the seed before, if we use that thing to set the, the random seed using the random state, when we call our train test split, uh, you actually get the same split. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, and, and if I had gone back, so if, when I go back and fix this assignment, I'll probably do it and tell people because it, it's nicer to actually set your your state, set your seed directly when you call train test split to ensure that you're always getting the same split instead of the way I was expecting on the test. Unfortunately, because of the way I'm expecting on the tests. Um, I'm expecting that you set it before you call the function. So if you also set it in here, 
setting the seed twice, I hadn't thought about it, but it, it does actually change the, the sequence of the random things that you get. So, so here now I set it and I set it again, um, and we'll get, uh, we'll get an 80-20 split, but we'll get different values. Um, Um, or you can get different values. Was, okay, uh, yeah, I'm not getting different values now, but um, but but apparently you, you can get different values um, um, uh, if if the random seed is set uh, more than once. So I think that that's what's happening. So anyway, the the I I didn't really mean the test to be. You know, that I'm constraining you so much, but but yeah, um, like I said in the announcement, basically just uh, uh, don't set, don't use the random state. Just use, just set the seed um, uh, where you're asked to set it. In fact, if you look in the tests, uh, so when I run the tests, um, that's what I'm doing. So like um, um, I talked about this last time. So if you look at the test for task three, basically. Um, Um, we basically set the random seed before we um, uh, in the setup. So basically, we're, we're setting the random seed every time uh, before we call your function, um, um, uh, the, your function with the learning curve errors, right? So, um, so yeah. To summarize that, for the third task. You, sh you shouldn't set the seed inside of your learning curve errors using seed or using the random state. Um, instead, just expect it should be set beforehand. And yeah, so in other places, whenever you call learning curves, you probably have to call the random seed before you call the learning curve errors uh, when you're generating those learning curves. All right. Um, that makes sense. So that, that's just what you need to do for that uh, third uh, question in order to get it to pass the test. So. Uh, and like I said, when, when I go back and redo this, I might, uh, um, uh, it probably would be nicer to have that actually called when you do the train test split. Um, so some people that were doing that, that, that was a good idea. Uh, but, but yeah, you won't be able to do that and, and, and get the test to pass on this assignment here. Um, let me, uh, and, you know, let me know if anybody has a question. So um, uh, if you have something else you want to ask about on the assignment three, let me know. Um, I'll do this, and maybe again at the end I'll also uh, go, come back and talk about assignment three. Another thing I wanted to mention maybe, um, uh, there is some of these, uh, these IPython notebook magics in here. So this, um, you probably had to figure this out from assignment one. But yeah, if, if you don't have these in here, you have to be careful that if you're editing a file that gets imported, uh, you have to either restart your kernel or just make certain that that, that file gets reloaded, re-imported. Uh, but having in, these in here should make it a little bit easier for you to do this stuff. So for example, um, let's do like the task uh, one here. The, the, the first function was supposed to be, was meant to be relatively uh, easy, right? So. Um, uh, when you run these tests, uh, let me look at the test for that one. So I'm, I'm not really testing very much. I'm only testing that uh, you actually are returning back um, NumPy in, in dimensional arrays. So both of them, the types have to be in dimensional arrays that you return from your implementation of the task one load data, uh, and they have to be of a particular shape. So X has to be uh, a two-dimensional with 100 rows and one column, and Y needs to be a vector with just 100 items in it. Right? That's the only thing that's being tested for the, the task one. Right? So I can actually get that to, um, to, to pass relatively easy. So the, the stub that I give you for task one is actually returning like an empty array uh, actually, an array, uh, a vector with one item in it. Uh, but we could, for example, create um, uh, of course, this wouldn't be correct. I would take points off if you did it like this. But um, uh, since it's only testing the shape, um, that should actually pass the test here. So the, the point I was making though, so now that I did that, um, 
uh, if I just save the file, since we're doing that, uh, that, that IPython magic at the top, I shouldn't have to like reload, restart my kernel or anything like that. I should be able to just uh, rerun this um, and it will uh, um, um, do, the, do the correct thing. So since I just modified the, the file, it will re-import those changes um, and um, um, uh, should pass if I um, um, had my uh, things uh, correct here. So double object can't be interpreted as an integer. Oh, right. Um, I made a mistake on that. So when you call random, uh, it doesn't take a tuple. It just takes all your dimensions that you want. So let's try it again. So all I have to do in order to, you know, I don't have to reload anything or anything. Um, I should just be able to save my file. Um, and that IPython magic will allow me to just rerun the cell and it should get imported. So there we go. So yeah, it's passing. Although it's not passing correctly, it's not really doing, it's not really loading the data, but it's passing the only things that were being tested, uh, which was just the shape and the type of the thing there. So. All right. So anyway, I hope that makes things that you, uh, I didn't really have that on the first one, so you probably, probably had to figure this out yourself, but um, uh, now this should allow you, if, if you directly edit and save the file, you don't have to do too much special to actually run what you just tried to implement. You should be able to just rerun the cell and it will automatically reload and re-import uh, changes that you make. All right. Um, what else? Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions. Um, so yeah, there's some, oh yeah, there was one more thing I wanted to mention for you guys that are here. Um, I did throw in a discussion, summary and discussion. Um, so for one, let me remind the guys that are, you people that are here, uh, that, you know, do use your tools. Um, so you should be using the stuff in the markdown cell. So I still get people, you know, giving me stuff that's that's really written English uh, and doing things like uh, putting in like a code cell with comments or something like that, right? So don't do that. Um, you know, you should be, if, if you're discussing, if you're writing written English, you should be using markdown cells. Um, and for this one, you should go ahead and put your discussion where I asked. So you should just be editing uh, that markdown cell and put your discussion. The other thing, you know, I mentioned, I did throw in, um, I, I asked you to kind of fill out this table. I gave you a little bit of some instructions on this. So for the lasso and the ridge models, um, try and give me at least three uh, different values of alpha. So try and give me one good one where you thought that the model was about right. It wasn't underfitting or overfitting. Um, and also, though, give me an example where you were using an alpha for lasso where it was underfitting, obviously underfitting on the model, and um, a value for lasso where it was overfitting, right? So just to show me that you did three things. And again, also, you know, your results should be put into this table, right? So you should put in your alpha value that you had um, and the, um, um, the resulting R squared score and the resulting RM at root mean squared error that you got. Uh, for the underfit, overfit, and just right fit uh, when you did lasso and ridge. Um, but um, um, in terms of the, the code that you leave in your notebook, leave in the alpha that was the, the good fit, the good model, not the underfit or the overfit, right? Um, Okay, any questions about that? So, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. Um, give me a little bit of discussion. So I'm, I'm going to be too tough on this, but I'm looking for a couple sentences or so at least at a minimum. Uh, you know, where you kind of try and address some of the, the points that I raised here in terms of um, uh, your observations, uh, what worked and didn't for the alpha, um, things like that. Uh, um, so. okay. um, yeah, 
Yeah, and I, I don't. I mean, there have been some examples of using grid search. So the the last test is a little bit more open ended. I didn't give like a test for this, but I am expecting you to try and create a grid search. Uh, what did I say? Um, um, I mean, I specifically asked you to do it for Lasso, although to tell you the truth, I probably wouldn't mind uh, if you wanted to do, uh, try and do a grid search over um, a ridge regression. Uh, but here, the way it says it is, yeah, to do a grid search over Lasso, over just trying out different alpha parameters, right? So, and try and be honest with this. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mind if you end up with a bad alpha that you report for step seven and above that really wasn't the very best kind of alpha for a good model. Uh, right, so, so see if you can, you know, by trying different values by hand, if you can come up with something that you think is kind of a good fit model, and then compare that to what you, what you got here, doing a more systematic grid search, right? So if you do a more systematic grid search, so this should tell you which value of alpha for regularization gets you the lowest root mean squared error if, if you set the grid search correctly. And if you um, uh, uh, search a, a sufficient number of alpha, a sufficiently number, a large number of grid points, right? Uh, so you should end up creating a grid. I don't know. I mean, you know, if, if you create, if you try to search thousands of alpha, it'll take your notebook a long time. But you probably want to have a grid that you at least search a couple, twenty or fifty different values of alpha or something like that um, on this last one. Um, over an appropriate range. And you, you probably should have a good kind of appropriate range if you do what I asked for on task seven here. So you kind of know something that's underfitting and something that's overfitting. So you need to search in kind of that range um, to, to see how um, the, uh, the, the, the error, the cost uh, changes um, as a function of different values of alpha um, um, uh, changing. So. All right. And then um, uh, I can talk more about this next week after we have the results, but you don't really have to do much for the last part. Uh, you should be able to just uncomment this stuff and you'll get a, another example. There, oh, there is kind of an example of doing a grid search here, but we're showing doing a grid search over different degree, different polynomial degrees instead of changing the alpha regularization for, um, for like a lasso. All right, uh, I think that was all I wanted to mention. So, um, any other, anybody have a, like a different question about three? It is due tomorrow, so I'm looking for people to submit stuff. Uh, like usual, I think the the time might say five o'clock somewhere, but uh, as long as you get it in sometime by tomorrow, I'll, you know, that'll be fine. Um, I'll probably be grading sometime on Saturday, though, um, for this one. So. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I might, so I might come back to this, give you another chance at the end of class if anybody has any questions on that. But uh, let me go ahead and uh, talk about regularization in a little bit more detail today. So give me a moment to get this up here. Um, there's not a whole lot actually to go over here, so it might be relatively quick. Open up my container again. This notebook doesn't have anything that takes very long, so I'm going to make sure it's still running here. All right. Um, so, yeah, for the, the, the tasks like five and six, um, uh, you need to be, you're going to be doing, um, trying to do, use some regularization to f try and uh, find a good fitting model, okay? So what is regularization? Um, so when we're doing supervised learning and machine learning uh, for machine learning task, uh, we're always going to be fighting overfitting, okay? So you should be familiar with that concept now of overfitting versus underfitting. Um, so... Uh, um, um, so creating like learning curves and plotting learning curves, that's one way that you can try and determine 
where you are on that scale, whether you might be overfitting or underfitting or not. Uh, once you determine that you're overfitting, uh, there's different techniques you can use in order to fight that, in order to try to get back to a model that's uh, you know the right power, that, that's, that's performing well, basically. Right? Uh, so regularization is one of those techniques, uh, a basic one. And in practice, um, yeah, so in practice, you know, you'll, you won't know kind of the right complexity of your model. Uh, also in practice, uh, like especially for big data sets nowadays, you might have a large number of features. So it'd be, it's easy to create models that will overfit. Uh, right, so, so, uh, so in, in those cases, what you need is then once your model is overfitting, you need to do something um, uh, to, to get a model that's of the right power that generalizes well. Okay. Um, so, so for the the stuff that we're doing um, using polynomial regression, uh, if if the model is overfitting, uh, an obvious thing to do would be to just decrease the um, the the you know the 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 degree, right? So, if we try a, a model that's to the hundredth degree, hundredth degree polynomial, if that seems to be overfitting, we could try just a degree 50 model, right? But what, what that would correspond to for a, a more real kind of data set would be uh, that that's you're removing features or you're not engineering a bunch of new features from the original features that you had, right? That's not always possible on a real data set. So instead, uh, you might want to use regularization. Regularization is basically, so, so the first one we'll look at is ridge regularization. We're, we're basically just adding on a penalty um, to the cost function, right? So all this does, again, all we're doing is summing up the square of the theta parameters, right? So we, we did this, uh, we, we summed up the square of the errors for our uh, mean squared error function. So, so this isn't the, the, the square of the errors, this is the, the, the square of the actual value of each of our um, theta, of, of each of the model parameters that we have right now, right? So you can imagine, I mean, you know, if, if this is zero or small, uh, the square of that is zero. So if all the thetas are close to zero, the sum of that will be small. Right? But anytime you have one of those model parameters that's big, whether big negative or big positive, the square of that will be even bigger um, and you'll get a, a large sum. Right? And all we do is we just add that on to the, the, the cost. So, so we won't repeat the calculation for the, the mean squared error, right? where you're taking the errors, uh, you square them, you sum them up, take the average of that. That's the mean squared error. So whatever you have that for some set of theta, uh, if you want to regularize, you, you just add in this penalty function, right? So you sum up the squares of the values of the theta uh, and add that, and that becomes your cost. Right? So what, what that does is that uh, um, if your thetas are really big, that increases your cost, right? So your final cost, you're adding in. So if all your thetas are, are far away from zero, uh, this sum will be big, you'll end up with a bigger cost, right? So what that means is that if you try to add in this penalty, if you have two models that are performing equally, but one model can get good performance with the theta close to zero, and the other model gets a similar performance, but with really big theta, uh, the, the, the model where the theta are small or close to zero will, will be preferred, it'll win out because uh, it'll get penalized. The, the model with big thetas will get penalized, so its resulting cost function will be much bigger than a similarly performing model that doesn't end up getting any penalty from this. All right? so, uh, I, so, so I don't know if, if, if I'm doing a good job explaining that, but, but I think of that as just a penalty. Um, and then I skipped over this alpha, but alpha is a, a scaling parameter, and that's directly what you're basically using for like task five and six on the assignment. If alpha is zero, then no matter what the parameters are, that you're just multiplying times zero. So, so, so doing an alpha of zero means that you're not using regularization at all. all right? The bigger the alpha is, the more important this penalty is in relationship to the mean squared error cost function that we have been using, that we used before, right? So if, if alpha is 100, 
then you know these things need to be really small. Uh, uh, your 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 theta parameters need to be really small in order for your cost function to end up being small. So the bigger alpha is, the more weight, the more importance you're putting on that penalty in relation to the, um, uh, the, the cost function that we have. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't think I need to rerun this. So uh, if we do some examples, be a little bit more concrete, that might help you kind of understand what's going on. So let's... Um, um, oh, this is called ridge regression, uh, where we're using this form for our penalty or for our regularization penalty. Um, so we'll, we'll see. So the lasso uses a slightly different form. Um, this is also known as, as uh, the L2 norm. I think I discussed this here. So the, you might also hear this type of penalty for regularization referred to as L2 or L2 norm regularization. Um, So anyway, like, like, um, like we did on Tuesday, uh, uh, we're just going to use some made-up data uh, with, where we added some random noise. So here, the true function is a polynomial that's uh, a, a quadratic. So it's 1 half x squared plus 3 fourths x plus uh, 3. Right? So, those are the, so we've got three parameters that we want to fit here, uh, theta 2, theta 1, and theta 0. Right? Um, that we add some noise to. Right? So uh, if we create, if we use a ridge regression, if we use an alpha zero, that means that the penalty is zero. So this really is just equivalent to doing linear regression. Right? So ridge regression with an alpha zero gives you, should give you exactly the same result as the, the straightforward linear regression. Right? Or we can use slightly bigger ones. So, so the second one here, we do the same thing. Um, uh, we're, we're, fitting, uh, we're, we're fitting a model that has degree 25, right? So, so it would potentially greatly overfit this model, this, uh, our actual data here that's only a quadratic. Right? But then, you know, we use no regularization or we use a small amount of regularization, so an alpha of 1 in this case, or kind of a large alpha of 100. Okay? So if you haven't um, run this notebook before, you know, what would you predict? Right, from what we've described on what uh, uh, this type of regularization does. Right? So if, if you've been following what my, my discussion or my logic here, if alpha is zero, you're not doing any regularization, so you should ex expect the same thing that we showed on Tuesday. Right? So d fitting a degree 25 model should very overfit the data, so it should wiggle around a lot. Try to, try to go through every point if you're not if the model is overfitting, right? So with no alpha, the, the, we expect the model to be overfitting here. Right? If if it's if you use, I didn't I maybe didn't talk about it, but if you use a really big alpha, um, it's going to ignore the cost function. It's just going to say, I want all the parameters to be zero, right? So so if your alpha is too high, if you get too much regularization, it just drives everything to be zero, and the result is you just get one straight line. Um, and I kind of, a subtle thing on this, the textbook discusses this. If, if you pay real close attention, this really only sums up the thetas from 1 to n, but we're starting at theta 0 because we, we have a, a value for the bias term. It doesn't actually add in the, uh, the bias term uh, theta. So that allows the bias term to be whatever it needs to be. Uh, but if alpha is really big, every other thing except for theta zero, except for the bias term, uh, will get driven to zero. Right. So the result for, for a, a, a theta that's too high is you'll just get a straight line that goes through basically about the average uh, of all the, the, the values of the points that you have. Okay? And if you can't visualize that, you get this result. Um, um, although uh, for using the square, it doesn't tend to drive, it, it tends to get the, all the values small, but it doesn't tend to drive them completely to zero. Uh, the, the next thing we'll look at uh, where we use the, the, the lasso regression actually gets everything to zero. So, um, so you don't get exactly a straight line, but, but um, so let's take these one at a time. So when alpha is zero, the model's overfit. 
Um, and um, I see that I noticed, noticed this is kind of this, this is just kind of an aside here, but it's a little bit chunky here. My my grid spacing isn't isn't sufficient enough to visualize. It should, it should look smooth. So I really should increase this here. So um, when we were plotting out the true function, we were only using 100 points. I need more than that. So let's try 1,000. That looks a little bit smoother. So, uh, anyway, so um, no regularization. Our degree 25 model overfits, so it wiggles around a lot. Right? So it's, it's, it's minimizing only the cost function. Um, and so since it overfits, uh, it ends up modeling the noise too much instead of modeling the true function. The, the true function is plotted as the, the, the dashed black line here. Right? That's, that's our, um, um, that's our uh, 1 half x squared plus 3 fourths x plus 3 in the range from negative 1 to 1 here. Um, so if we go the opposite direction, alpha is, is probably too big here. So it tends to end up with all the parameters of 0, although they don't completely get driven to 0 when you use the L2 um, uh, ridge uh, regularization. But you get kind of mostly a straight line going through about the average where the average of these points are uh, that we had here. Um, so if you get alpha about right, what you expect is your model is going to be close to, even though you know we're fitting a degree 25 polynomial, the uh, alpha around 1, this might not be optimal, so maybe something we could find something that would be even better here. Uh, but something in the right range um, is going to try um, 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 and drive the parameters to zero, so the result should be it will de-emphasize all the unneeded powers, x cubed, x4, x5, and we should mostly end up with only the x, x to the zero, the, the x squared, the x, uh, and the bias term. Um, and, and we end up with something uh, tending to get close to the true function here within the range that we fed our model to. Right? That, um, and we can look at it. So, for example, um, these are the actual parameters. So remember, we're, we're fitting a degree 25 polynomial. So if you print out the, you, there's only one intercept or bias term ever for a regression. Uh, but we should end up with uh, 25 um, uh, features for our degree 25 polynomial. Because we've got one for each of the, the powers, x to the 1, x to the 2, up to x to the 25. So uh, without any alpha, uh, it badly overfits. So you notice we get some, some, some of these are really big. Uh, I mean, all of them tend to end up being really big, right? And, and the result of that uh, is that really wiggly line here that we're getting for our fit. Um, and if we look at the large here, though, um, um, again, because of the way that we calculate that, um, that penalty term, it's not going to affect the, uh, the, the intercept or the bias term. So it ends up being about three on all these, right, which is around uh, the, the average here. But uh, most all of these get driven down to relatively small values, to around 0.1 or less. Right? So, so they're getting trying to get pushed down to close to zero. So the only one um, that has some values that are bigger, bigger than 0.1, there are a few that are a little bit bigger than 0.1. There's a 0.18 there. But remember, so we've got, um, um, this should be one half, and that should be 3 fourths uh, in our true function. But anyway, those are big. But the rest of them were small. So you know, the, the alpha of about 1.0 uh, for this set of data um, um, is mostly de-emphasizing everything except for the x0, x1, and x2 uh, parameters here. And that's why we get the, uh, the, the orange line here that's about, uh, that's, that's looking OK, pretty good um, for the fit here. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, 
just uh, to let you know, so you might run across. Actually, you do need to know this uh, because so what, one reason why it's 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 a good idea to kind of learn uh, a little bit about the details of how the stuff works, the mathematics behind it is some of the stuff creeps out into you know uh, into uh, things that you need to use. So for example, uh, we're using. Uh, th this this penalty for regularization uh, for the ridge uh, is also known as an L2 norm. So uh, in some places you'll see parameters um, called L2, or, or, or you can ask that I want to use uh, a regularization pen penalty, and you can specify I want L1 or L2 or a combination of them. Right? So that's what the the S, the stochastic gradient descent regressor does. That you can use L1 or L2. Um, uh, regularization penalty uh, and then pass in an, an alpha value or you can use both actually so that's all we're doing here so this um, although uh, if you look closely you don't get exactly the same results which I'm not exactly certain why I, I, I thought that the SGD regressor is probably using the same um, uh, well uh, yeah I passed in a different alpha but even if you use like a alpha of one you don't get exactly the same fit uh, but I'm not exactly certain why Uh, you, we should compare this to the uh, the one here where we're also using alpha 1.0. Um, but anyway, that should be doing something similar, but but obviously there, it, it does something a little bit different. So, um, okay, but, but anyway, yeah, back back to my point that. Um, uh, one of the reasons why it's good to get down to this detail to understand things is that helps you understand. So, so even if you're only, you know, if you're never writing your own ridge regression uh, or writing your own implementation of uh, a cost function and adding a penalty, uh, but if you're if, even if you're using a library like like Scikit-Learn, uh, sometimes you need to kind of know in order to understand what these parameters mean in order to use the functions like ridge or SGD regression. Um, okay, so then I also ask you to do a lasso regression. It's pretty similar. Um, so, uh, but uh, we just use a slightly different penalty, uh, and, and this is also similar to you know what we talked about using the absolute value or the square of the values. Uh, so you can use the the mean absolute value or the mean uh, mean absolute error or the mean squared error can be used as a cost function. Uh, same thing here. So the L1 norm uh, is really just the absolute value. Um, so, but you, they, they give slightly different properties. The textbook, uh, you should read the discussion. The textbook talks a little bit about, you know, what, why, um, uh, and, and what happens uh, when you use the absolute value versus the square for your penalty function. But we're doing the same thing here. We're only adding up uh, the terms 1 to n, not the zeroth term, but we're, we're adding up the absolute values of them instead of the squares. Um, and uh, the, the, the most obvious, so, so we do the same thing here. Um, so we're going to fit the same uh, set of data, but using uh, a lasso, so using this penalty. Um, um, it turns out and this this might be relevant, so I'm not certain that you'll be able to use like a alpha of zero when you do the lasso for your assignment three. Uh, and again, I'm not exactly certain why I haven't gone and and, and um, um, researched this. Uh, but but yeah, you will get convergence errors. So it's, it's obviously not doing exactly the same thing that the ridge does of just of just multiplying the penalty term times alpha. Uh, or uh, um, uh, because you can see even if you use zero, um, so here we're, we're doing the same thing but using a ridge, so we're using this penalty with an alpha of zero, uh, an alpha of uh, a small one. Uh, in this case, one is, is actually really big. You get overfitting with one. Um, so we use one, we use 0 0.01 for the, uh, the, the, the value in between here. Um, and uh, so when I use zero, though, I mean, it does look like it's still regularizing, so I'm not certain why, uh, but you get something that looks pretty similar to um, um, the, uh, uh, the model where we've done some regularization before. So, 
Uh, so it, it, it doesn't drive everything to zero in that case. So, so zero doesn't uh, end up getting all the parameters to be driven close to zero like, you, like we'll see for, these, for the other values of alpha. Um, so it looks, it looks kind of like the previous one, um, some value of alpha where we did uh, a ridge regression on. But notice here, so um, I'll show the figure, I'll go back to the figure in a second. So um, here was where it was too large. Uh, so notice that it, the, the, the result of using the absolute value for the penalty term uh, instead of the square, um, it tends to try, it, it, try and drive unneeded things to zero. And that can be useful in some cases. Right? So sometimes when you're trying to fit a set of data, some features are not really useful for a model. So sometimes you can use this type of regularization to find features that get driven to zero when you regularize them with this type of penalty. Uh, and those features might be features that you can really just drop. They're, they're not being useful for modeling. Right? So if it's too high though, everything gets driven to zero, you end up with an exactly a straight line through kind of the, the average of the values. If you get the regularization about right, uh, notice how good this is. So we get about three-fourths and about one-half here, uh, and most everything else is zero or small uh, for our parameters. Right? So um, for the stuff we're doing for this assignment, the, the, the lasso could be especially effective because uh, if you get the alpha about right, you will end up with only the, um, the, the thetas for the, the, the degree that you need to get a good model, and you'll drive everything else to zero. For, for the things that are overpowered, right? So since my model is quadratic at degree two, a good value of alpha mostly only kept the, the x to the zero, x to the one, and x to the squared power, and got everything else to be pretty small or zero. Right. And the result is this. So the, the overfit model looks kind of more like, um, I mean, it wiggles, but not as much as before, so it looks more like, um, um, uh, like one of these here uh, that we had on the ridge. Um, and the underfit model, though, is exactly just a straight line. Everything got driven to zero except for the bias term. So we just have a straight line that goes through y at that bias term. Uh, and that basically should be the a So if I averaged the, the y of all those points, that's where that was. And I have too high of, a, uh, of an alpha here. Uh, and my good model here um, is pretty good. So it only had really uh, uh, x0, x1, and x squared terms but, um, uh, for our alpha of 0.1 here. All right. All um, Okay, so yeah, I, uh, for the assignment three, I, I basically just asked you to lasso and elastic. I, I didn't ask you, I mean, you might want to add some stuff in there. So, you know, just for your own, when you're trying to figure out the function for assignment three, you know, you might want to uh, uh, actually display the parameters like I showed here, because that'll tell you, like, for example, when you're doing lasso, whether things are getting driven to zero or not. Right? So if stuff isn't getting driven to zero yet, your, your alpha is probably too small. It's still um, overfitting, um, and but but if your alpha is too big, uh, you might drop too much. So you get most everything or everything dropped to zero, um, uh, and you can more easily see that with lasso, uh, with the L1 penalty than you can with the ridge regression penalty. Um, Okay, and uh, so like as a final thing in this chapter four of the textbook, um, it also introduces elastic net, um, which is, I don't remember where the name, I, I kind of skipped over the name for the, the lasso, so these names mean things, so lasso is the least absolute shrinkage, but, but yeah, I always just think of that as doing the, the, the absolute value penalty or the L1 penalty, and uh, the ridge, I can't remember what the ridge refers to, uh, but, but that's the L2. So uh, the elastic net um, um, is really just, um, if you wanted to, to uh, apply both L1 and L2 regularization, uh, you can use an elastic net. So, 
um, it, it does something like this. So again, here it helps to know the math in order to be able to use the parameters uh, that it, that uh, that the elastic net uh, needs for it. So uh, in order to combine, we're still using alpha, uh, and it actually uses the same alpha for both of those, which may or may not be not not flat. I, I can imagine that you might want to do something where you do, do a different alpha for the two things that you're combining. But anyway, so we, we still use an alpha uh, to regulate how important our penalty is going to be, uh, but we also use both of them. Uh, and R basically uh, is your uh, um, uh, the, the thing here that controls uh, how much emphasis to give to the, uh, the absolute value or to the square penalty. Right? So if R is 1, uh, this is just going to be 0. So, so when R is 1, you just get all, it's equivalent to doing uh, lasso or L1 regularization. And if R is 0, that goes away, um, and this becomes just one half of that. I can't remember why it's one half. The, the textbook probably discusses that. So. Um, all right. Oh, and, and uh, yeah, in terms of, like, if you're using scikit-learn, uh, if you want to change that ratio, it's called L1 ratio instead of R. So L1, kind of as the name implies, um, uh, if this is 1, uh, I mean, that's basically R. So, so uh, an L1 ratio of 1 means you just use all L1, so you're, uh, you're actually just do, doing a lasso in that case. And, and uh, L1 ratio of 0 means you're using all um, L2, or the square penalty. So you're just doing the equivalent of a ridge in that case. And a value between 0 and 1 gets you a mix of the two. Um, I use, I use uh, regularization a lot. I, don't, I, I haven't found it very useful to, use elast to, to combine them very often. Um, but uh, it, is, it is there. I guess some people sometimes, in some um, um, uh, circumstances, this might be useful. So, so yeah, for this example here, we just used uh, a 50% mixing with a 0 0.01 alpha, um, and um, I didn't plot anything, but uh, presumably this would probably be a relatively good fit. So you can see, again, most stuff is relatively small, except for we got about three-fourths and one-half, um, and, and three uh, for the bias term there. Um, okay, as a, a final thing, so let me mention about early stopping. Um, so uh, there's actually an even easier way to do regularization or to fight overfitting um, is this idea of, over, of, of early stopping. Okay? Uh, but uh, another thing I wanted to mention though, I, I wanted to talk, you're doing things where you're plotting the learning curves on this assignment, uh, the same like we did in, in, um, uh, on Tuesday. We had some examples of plotting these, like these here. Let me get, let me get one uh, that was our example for the overfitting. Okay? So when we did these learning curves here, um, we were actually fitting a, a linear regression. Uh, but we, we did a complete fit. Okay? So we didn't, uh, even if we were using like stochastic gradient descent, which would have multiple epochs. Uh, the result that we did, uh, we, we did a complete fit, um, but we did it on just one point and then two points, uh, and then up to all the points that we used for training with. Right? So that, that's how you're doing the learning curves on this assignment. Right? But um, um, I, I, I maybe didn't mention it, but when we talked about gradient descent, we were actually showing learning curves there, although uh, technically these aren't learning curves, but we were showing the same idea of the, 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 the evaluation of the cost um, as we were training the model. But in this case, uh, what we're doing is, remember for the gradient descent, we would do what were called epoch, epochs or gradient steps. So this was the cost after doing one complete uh, epoch of training, and then after two, three, or so on, right? But but the idea is the same, and if we wanted to, we could have also calculated the cost. This, this is just the cost on the data that we trained with. 
So we're, we're seeing that the, the cost um, is reducing over epoch of, of, of training during, during gradient descent. But we could have held back some, some test data or validation data and also shown how that uh, changed um, um, as we were doing epochs of training using gradient descent, right? Both of those are really the same idea. They're, they're both uh, plotting learning curves. Um, and if you read the textbook, it had this picture, right? So when you're using, uh, typically, th this is more typical, like if, if I'm training like a neural network, uh, like a deep network or something, deep learning or something like that. So in that case, uh, it might take a long time, it might take many epochs of training of some sort of optimizer like gradient descent uh, in order to get a good model. So you would, you, would, you would monitor your training by plotting a learning curve like this. So as I'm training over epochs of my, ep of my um, optimization, um, I'm, I'm plotting how it does on the training set, and, but I'm also uh, calculating on data it isn't trained with, a validation or a test set. I'm plotting those together um, as, as we are training over epochs, as we're optimizing over some number of epochs. So this is what typically happens is uh, for a model that's overpowered, um, it will, uh, on, on, you expect that it will always keep decreasing the error on the data it trains with. So as it overfits, it keeps getting better and better on the data you train with, right? So, so it keeps reducing the cost more and more. But at some point, the, the model is going to start overfitting. So if you're, mon if you're monitoring the, the validation of the test errors, the, 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 the performance on the data it wasn't trained with, uh, it'll go down, uh, but at some point uh, you get, you're just right in terms of your parameters and then it'll start overfitting. And then the, 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 the validation um, error will start increasing again. Right? So this is, a, this is a very typical thing to do uh, if you're training like a neural network or something that, that's uh, doing many epochs of training, right? So you monitor uh, your, your train performance and your test performance, um, and then uh, at some point uh, when your model stops uh, decreasing, you know, stops getting better um, on your validation or your test data, um, you can just stop training at that point, right? So, so you know, um, Early stopping is, is a simple idea, uh, but it works surprisingly well, right? So, so if you just plot your learning curves like this, uh, and, and you just have to you know, keep the parameters of your model, so you have to be able to detect uh, when you start to overfit, uh, and then you just use those parameters right there. So when you reach your best performance, um, that's your, uh, that, that's your uh, as good of a model as you can get with, you know, however, the, the, whatever you're doing, um, you know, a neural network or something. Um, okay, so just to, to summarize that though, so, so all, these are, uh, all these forms of regularization that we looked at, um, um, in all cases, that, that's the, the, the issue, is that um, uh, usually it's easy to build models that are going to overfit. But overfitting models are not good. They're, they're not going to perform well uh, on unseen data. They're not going to generalize well. Right? So we always have to be aware of and fighting that overfitting. So uh, the, this stuff and this assignment three is all about you learning the basic tools for being able to detect, you know, uh, be able to figure out, do I think I'm underfitting? Do I think I'm overfitting? Do I think I'm about right? Uh, and then also to fight that, uh, to um, um, build models that um, uh, are not overfitting or underfitting and that will generalize well, um, that will work well on unseen data uh, in production environments. Um, um, so all the rest of the stuff that we'll look at in this class, you know, can usually use the same or similar kinds of techniques for regular for for fighting overfitting um, and for you know uh, um, 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 monitoring the performance of your model uh, to try and tell um, how it's doing. Um, um, 
Okay, any, any questions on that? Like I predicted, uh, there wasn't a lot of material on that, so we still got about 15 minutes. Um, so... Um, then let me give you just one more chance on the assignment three. So, um, I don't know if anybody came in after I started on this, but um, does anybody have anything they wanted to bring up or ask about on the assignment? So, so yeah, it's, it's trying to walk you through, you know, so um, um, you start by creating an obviously underfit model um, by using a degree two polynomial. Then you write your function so you can do the learning curves, uh, so you can figure out these kinds of things. Uh, and then you what? Ask for like a degree 100 model to try and make something that's obviously overfit. Um, and then um, uh, do some regularization using uh, lasso and ridge. So. so yeah, I guess I kind of swipped the, the so the the, the lasso. Um, uh, we do that first, but uh, that should give you maybe a bit of a chance to uh, a secondary goal when you're doing this one uh, might be, you know, you, you might want to print your, um, uh, your your parameters that you get from your fit uh, and try and see if you can estimate like what you think the actual degree of the true polynomial is. So, so what, what power it is, which things seem to get um, um, driven to zero or not. So Lasso can help you with that, kind of thinking about it. That might help you also think about some stuff to discuss um, on 7 when you're supposed to summarize and discuss things. So. Um, all right. Yeah, that's all I had. Is that, is that good? All right. Um, so, yeah, I'll stop there. I'll leave you